Golden Radio Hour. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, The Roads Must Roll, by Robert Heinlein. Hear them hum, watch them run, oh, our job is never done, for our roadways go rolling along. While you ride, while you glide, we are watching down in sight, so your roadways keep rolling along. Oh, it's high, high he, the rotor men are we. Check off the sectors loud and strong, one, two, anywhere you go. You are bound to know that your roadways keep rolling along. Keep them rolling! That your roadways keep rolling along. It was in the middle 1950s that the automotive age began to die. The traffic engineers had long expected it. For years, they had watched our vast cities sprawl and spread out, spill over into the countryside become more and more dependent on motor transportation. And then finally, the inevitable breaking point was reached. The growing flood of cars and buses and trucks began to swamp the streets and arterial highways. The building of roads could no longer keep pace. The superhighways clogged, congested, became packed with cars stalled bumper to bumper. And the cities began to die of slow strangulation, for the traffic could no longer roll. And then the engineers took over. They banned the automobiles, tore up the superhighways, and in their place they built the rolling roads, mechanized roads that moved like huge conveyor belts, whirling along on their giant rotors at speeds ranging from 5 to 100 miles an hour, carrying the freight, the food, and the people from city to city and coast to coast. And no one worried over the fact that if the road should ever stop, our whole economic life would stop. For the machinery had never failed yet. But people forgot that machinery depends on men. The men who run it. Who makes the roads roll? We do! We do! That's right, the engineers. We're the brains of the road. And where would the public be if we didn't keep the roads rolling? Right behind the eight ball. And everybody knows it. All right, then. We're the men who hold the power, and it's time we started using it. We've called this meeting of the Engineers Control Committee because that's what we want to do, control. Because I'm tired of taking orders from the Transport Commission, from slick desk jockeys like Jim Gaines, who don't even know a rotor bearing from a field call. Now let Gaines yammer about our duty to the public. That's a lot of eyewash. We've got the power, and we're the men that count. Now it's time we quit fiddling around and use a little direct action to get what we want. Mr. Chairman! Mr. Chairman! The chair recognizes Brother Harvey of the Transport Mechanics Union. Thanks. Thanks. Now, I don't really belong here since I'm no engineer. I'm just here to represent the workers' union. But I want to know what's all the shouting for. You engineers have got better working conditions than we have, and we ain't kicking. You say the engineers are powerful. You say you can tie up the roads. Well, so can any screwball with a jar of nitroglycerin. And he wouldn't need no engineer's degree to do it, neither. Harvey! Harvey, are you speaking for your union now, or are you here as a stooge for the Transport Commission? Listen, Van Cleek, I helped fund my union. I led the strike in 75 for decent working conditions. 
Where were you engineers then? With the Finks! <laughs> Brother Harvey! Brother Harvey, remember, you're only a guest at this meeting. Go on, Van. Now listen, men. I'm one of the old engineers on the road. You all are. Worked up the hard way. We didn't go to the fancy technical institutes like those young punk cadet engineers the commission is training to take over our jobs unless we do something to stop them. Jim Gaines hasn't been able to fill us full of the old school spirit and, the, and that baloney about how the, the roads must roll. So all right then. Why don't we get smart for a change? What would happen if the roads stopped rolling? Maybe the country would begin to realize that they can't do it without us. Maybe we'd begin to get the things we want. Who says the roads must roll? <laughs> Yes? Your wife is calling, Mr. Gaines. Put her on. Jim, I want you to stop off on your way home. I'm sorry, darling, I can't make it. But you promised. I know, but Washington called in. They're sending Evans, the Australian Minister of Transport, through my sector today. I've got to show him through personally. Can't somebody else? I'm chief supervisor. Wouldn't be courteous. Courtesy begins at home. I've planned this dinner for weeks. Honey, the roads must roll. Oh, if you quote that nauseating slogan at me again, I'll divorce you. I can't help it, darling. I'll meet you at Stockton at 9 and we'll take in a show. Kiss Alan goodnight for me. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mr. Evans is here. Show him in. Well, good evening, Mr. Evans. Uh, I'm Gaines, chief engineer. How do you do, Mr. Gaines? They told me at the embassy you'd be the man to see. I, uh, I want to know how the roads work. I think we can handle that. Well, I'm not a technical man, Mr. Gaines. My field is sociology. So, suppose you tell me about the roads as if I were entirely ignorant. Fine. It's uh, nearly at dinner time. Uh, suppose we run up to Stockton Sector for dinner. It'll take us about an hour on the roads, and you can see them working. Excellent. If you'll excuse me a minute. Certainly. Hi, Chief. What can I do for you? Uh, Dave, you're on evening watch, eh? Uh -huh. uh, where's Van Cleek? He's going to some meeting. I'm going up to Stockton for dinner. Anything to report? No, sir. The roads are rolling. Okay. Keep them rolling. All right, Mr. Evans. Let's go. This is the low-speed strip. Ever ridden a conveyor before? Uh, no. It's quite simple. Remember to face the motion of the strip as you get on. There. You go right across. Each adjoining strip is a few miles an hour faster than the one next to it. Freight is carried on the 50-mile strip, most passenger traffic on the express strip. All right, now watch your step. Here we are. The maximum speed. One hundred miles an hour. It doesn't seem possible. This trip makes the round trip San Diego to Reno in 12 hours. Ready to eat? Uh, is this the restaurant? Jake's Steakhouse. Fastest meal on the road. Uh, is it really a proper restaurant? One of the best. Shall we go in? <laughs> uh, hello, Mr. Gaines. We don't see you much out on the road. Busy in the office, Jake. Two? Right this way. What'll it be? You order. Well, how about a steak? Two inches thick from a steer that died happy. Fine, fine. Uh, plug me in the phone, will you? There's one right next to you. Flank two, rare. You'll excuse me, Mr. Evans? Certainly. Davidson on watch. This is the chief. I'm at Jake's Steakhouse. You can reach me at 10L66. 10L66, right. Yeah, now they can get hold of me in an emergency. Oh? What kind of emergency could there be? Two, principally... Power failure on the rotors would bring the road to a standstill. That happened during rush hour. We'd have to evacuate millions of people from the road. As many as that? Easily. There are 12 million people dependent on this section of road. Gaines here. Hello, Chief Davidson. Just got the hourly reports in. Diego Circle, Bakerfield Sector, Stockton Sector, and Reno Circle all rolling. Oh, you didn't have to bother me with the hourlies, Dave. There's a supplementary from Sacramento. Proceed. Cadet engineer Gunther, while on watch, was found playing cards with C.J. Ross, technician on duty. Any damage? One rotor running hot, but still synchronized. It was jacked down and replaced. All right, have the Pam ask to give Ross his time and turn him over to civil authorities. Place Cadet Gunther under arrest and bring him to Rotown Central. Yes, sir. All right, keep him rolling. I was saying there were two possibilities of danger. Can you visualize what would happen if the strip under us would break? 
Oh, I, I hadn't thought of that. You, you don't realize you're traveling at 100 miles an hour. Well, it can't. Not now. The strip has a safety factor of over 12 to 1. It'd take a blowout of several miles of rotors and a failure of circuit breakers before the strip could part. But it happened once in the early days on the Philadelphia-Jersey City Road. The strip wasn't much more than a conveyor belt. It buckled for miles, crushing passengers against the roof. Forward section in front of the brakes spilled them down under into the rotors and rollers. Oh, was it very bad? Over 3,000 people were killed in that break. But the roads had to go on. The entire economic system hangs on the roads. If they stopped now, the country would starve. Well, uh, isn't it possible that you've become too dependent on these roads? I mean, if your whole economy is geared to the function of one type of machinery... The roads are foolproof now. The machinery is interlocked with an enormous safety factor. Yes, but in the long run, machinery depends on men. What if you had a strike? We had one back in 75. Well, there's not much danger of that anymore. No? Well, why not? Every cadet that goes to work on the roads today is a graduate of the United States Transport Academy. They're all picked men, screened for emotional stability, and trained to give us the same kind of loyalty that Annapolis and West Point develop in their men. I see. Uh, are you a graduate, Mr. Gaines? No, I'm too old for that. The academy wasn't set up till after the strike in 75. But it won't be long now, maybe five or ten years, before the oldest engineer on the roads is a man who's been through the academy. Gaines here. Davidson, there's another trouble report from Sacramento Sector. Again? What is it this time? What the... What is it? What happened? Emergency stop. Hello. Hello, Davidson. Phones are out. Come on. Jake! Jake! What is it, Earl? What's the matter with the road? Everybody stay in the restaurant. What's that? Probably somebody stepped onto the next strip. Got cut to ribbons. There'll be plenty of casualties. Jake, where's your getaway hat? In the pantry. Look here, aren't you? Aren't we going to help those people? I've got the whole road to think of. Don't bother me. Give me a hand, Jake. The hatch is stuck. If you're coming with me, Mr. Evans, you've got to move fast. I haven't got any time to waste. Where, uh, uh, where are we now? Freeway on top of the inner road ceiling. That's the outer shell over us. Are we going outside? No, there'll be an access down manhole over here. They're spaced every hundred feet. There, by the green light. Now, this will get us down on the northbound road. Careful, it's dark. Now, stand away from the door, Evans. Yes, But uh, this road is still rolling. It was only the 100-mile strip that stopped. That's what I want, a phone booth. Look out, excuse me. Look out. Hey, hey. Hey, I'm talking to my wife. What's the idea? Don't argue. Out. Yeah, but I... Emergency priority, division office. Davidson. Gaines here, report. Chief, where have you been? I've been calling you. Never mind that, report. 709, consolidated tension. Report strip 20, Sacramento sector, past emergency level. Interlocks acted and cut the strip out. Cause of failure unknown. Direct communication cut to Sacramento Control Office. Evacuation of Strip 20 commenced. No casualties. Hmm, there are casualties. I saw them. Put police and hospital routine A into operation. Get me Van Cleek. I want him to take over for me till I report in. We can't reach him, Chief. Shall I cut out the rest of the road? No. Keep those other strips rolling or we'll have a traffic jam the devil himself couldn't untangle. There are five million passengers on the road now. Notify the governor that I have assumed emergency authority. I'm all cadets available on the wait orders. Shall I recall technicians off no. watch? No. This isn't an engineering failure. That whole sector went out simultaneously. Somebody cut those rotors by hand. I want all available senior class cadets to report to Stockton Subsector, Office 10, with pistols and tear gas. Yes, sir. The governor wants to talk to you. He called in. Referring to someone else. I'm busy. I'll get back to you. I'm going down under. <laughs> Evans! Evans! I, I can't hear you. There's a noise. Put on this helmet. What? Helmet! Helmet! Oh, oh, yes. You can't hear without an anti-noise filter. Come on. Uh, what are we looking for? A recon car. There should be one here. Uh, uh, are those the rotors? No, the big ones are rotors. They drive the road. The little ones are rollers. They give continuous support. There's a watch gang now, jacking down a rotor. Can they hear us? No, the noise filter works on a four-foot radius. I'll flash him. Now he sees the light. Cadet Wilson reporting, sir. I want your recon car, emergency. Yes, sir, right over here, sir. Come on, Evans. Yes, sir. Oh, get in. But it's so small. You'll fit all right. You can take off your noise filter now. Hang on, she accelerates like a rocket. Ooh, I 
my stomach. Relay station. This is Gaines. Get me Davidson, senior watch officer. Mr. Gaines, the mayor wants to talk to you. I haven't got time. Get me Davidson. And leave this circuit hooked into Davidson's board until I tell you to cut it. Yes, sir. Here is the senior watch officer. Davidson. Gaines calling. Have you found out yet what's stopping the roads? No, sir. It's still a mystery to me. All right. I'm on my way in a recon car. Hold everything till I get there. Cadet Edmonds reporting, sir. Three platoons of cadet engineers standing by with tumblebug motorcycles. Armed? Pistols and tear gas as ordered, sir. Good. Assistant Supervisor Van Cleek is calling you on Circuit 9, sir. Van Cleek? It's about time. Cut me in. Yes, sir. Hello, Van. Where are you? Sacramento office. Now, listen. Sacramento? That's good report. In a pig's eye. What? I'm not your deputy anymore, Gaines. What are you talking about? Listen, don't interrupt me and you'll find out. You're through, Gaines. Ivan Pick is director of the Engineers Control Committee. We're taking over. Have you gone off your roller? We stopped Strip 20 just to give you a taste of what we can do. We're running things now. Man, you don't really think you can get away with this? You can't start Strip 20 until I'm ready to let you. I can stop the whole road if I have to. Man, click out call on the army. How will you get them here if the roads aren't rolling? Now listen, Gaines. Whoever controls the roads controls the country. And right now, that happens to be me. Now sign off, Gaines. Got to call the White House. You behave yourself and you won't get hurt. I don't believe it, sir. He's got us, Edmonds. We go in and blast him out, he may wreck the road. What's your rolling tonnage now? 53% under evening peak, sir. How about strip 20? Almost evacuated. Listen in on this, Davidson. Standing by, Chief. I'm going down inside with these cadets. We'll work north, overcoming any resistance that we may meet. The watch technicians and maintenance crews are to follow behind us. Each rotor, as they come to it, is to be cut out from under Sacramento's control, then hooked into the Stockton control board. Understand? Got it. Check. If it works right, we can move control of Sacramento sector right out from under Vance's feet. And he can stay in his office there till he's hungry enough to be reasonable. Edmonds, get me a pistol. Yes, sir. Mr. Gaines, there's a man here. He's badly hurt. He wants to see you. Take care of him. I haven't got time. He's from Sacramento sector. What? Bring him in. All right. Easy. Come on. Easy. Mr. Gaines. You're Harvey from the Mechanics Union, aren't you? I tried to warn you. I tried to get away. He shot me three times. Get a doctor. All right. Easy, Harvey. How long has this been building up? It's the men. It's, it's the engineers. I told them they were crazy. Told them the road's got to roll. When I tried to get away, they... <coughs> He's bleeding from the mouth. Sir. Harvey. Harvey, can you hear me? Come on, Edmonds. You better move. Hey, Pick! All right, you men. You saw Harvey brought in. How many of you want a chance to kill the louse that did it? I do. Very well. You men turn in your weapons and return to quarters. We've got a job to do to make sure the roads start rolling again. We haven't got time for infantile heroics. Anybody who hasn't got his mind on his job will be in the way. Now, here's the order. We move north, mounted on tumblebugs. We're going to try to regain control, rotor by rotor, before Sacramento sector knows we're moving. We've got to capture any watch personnel we run on before they can get word back. Surprise is vital. Use tear gas when possible. Shoot only when necessary. But get them before they can reach a phone jack. Any questions? No. Then move out. What's the score, Edmonds? 33 prisoners so far. Nobody killed. Whoops. Yes, yeah, since I rode one of these tumble bugs, I've gotten out of steer it. Well, sir, there's a man ahead. There at the road of base. Got a phone jacked in. Hurry. If he gets word back, we're sunk. I don't think he's seen us. I'll dismount and get him. Quick, he sees us. Here, you. Look out, he's got a gun. Oh, I got him. Grab his gun. Yes, sir. You had a phone jacked in, all right. We got through to Sacramento office. It's going to be tough. I don't know, sir. Maybe he didn't get the call through. Wait a minute. Listen. The road. Take off your noise filter. There. The road. The road.
road is stopping. Halt your men. Halt. Hold up there. Hold up. There's a recon car coming up. Relay station call for Mr. Gaines. Give it to me. Here you are, sir. Gaines here. Davidson here, Chief. Van Cleek's calling you. Who stopped the road? He did. All right. Cut Van Cleek into me. You thought I was fooling, huh, Gaines? What do you think now? All right, Van, the road has stopped. You won this trick. Then why don't you get smart and give up? You can't win. You forgot something, Van. You can't lick the whole country. Yeah? Gaines, I've got a switch button in my hand. If I push it, it'll blow 300 yards straight across the road. And then, for good measure, I'll take an axe and wreck the control station before I leave. That's pretty drastic, Van. Yeah, if I blow this charge in the middle of Sacramento sector, it'll get an awful lot of people. There are plenty of shopkeepers still on Strip 20, and that row of apartment houses next to the road will go. Look, Van, you don't want to blow the road, neither do I. Suppose I come up to your headquarters and talk this over. Two reasonable men ought to be able to make a settlement. Is this some kind of a trick? I'll come alone and unarmed. My men will stay here. All right. All right, Gaines. But one wrong move. And I blow the road. We've got to hurry, Dave. If I take too long, Van Cleek will get edgy and set off that charge. Failure report notes. One, strips must be cross-connected with safety interlocks so that when one dies, the other slow down. Two, the men. Yeah, I can't understand it. Psych tests are rigid. We've never had a failure in the Humwadsworth Burton method. And then suddenly a whole sector goes sour. How could Van Cleek get a whole crew of sight cleared men to revolt? It's easy, Dave. As my deputy, he was ex officio personnel officer for the whole road. He must have been faking psych records for years and transferring maladjusted men into his sector. I've got that personnel record, Mr. Gaines. Man's record. Masked introvert. Inferiority rating seven. Comment. Despite a potential instability shown on Wadsworth Curve, this officer is especially adept in handling men. He's adept, all right. I haven't got time for any more, Dave. You're not going up there to Sacramento, officer. I've got to. Well, you'll be armed. He'll kill you. I've got to take that chance. But unarmed? Why don't you call the army? He won't dare blow the road. Yes, then. he would. Look at that psych record. Hmm? He's putting up a big, brave front, but he's rotten inside. He wants to be taken seriously. He wants everybody to think he's the most dangerous man in the country. And if I call the army in, he'll try to prove it by blowing the road. How can you stop him, Mr. Gaines? He'll have a gun. What will you have? What will I have? Only a prayer. And what I know about Mr. Van Cleek. All right, Gaines. Director Van Cleek will see you now. Gaines is here, Director Van Cleek. Come in, Gaines. Behaving sensibly at last. You know I've got you where I want you, and there isn't anything you can do about it. I searched him, Director. He's unarmed. Mm -hmm. I want you to sign this now. It's a declaration of your recognition of the Engineers' Control Committee. You've got one minute to sign it, Gaines, or I'll push this button and blow up the whole sector. You better sign, Gaines. You need this gorilla with a gun, Van? Hey, you Can't listen... you handle one unarmed man alone? All right, Harry, out. What? what? Out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now sign. <laughs> What's so funny? You are. Uh, you start a revolution because you think the engineer should control the road. And then when you've got control, the only thing you can think of to do is blow it up. Tell me, what are you so scared of? I'm not scared. Yeah? Sitting there sweating all over that push button you're holding? Your buddies knew how afraid you were. They'd probably throw you into the rotors. I'm not afraid. <laughs> you're afraid of me right now. You're afraid I'll have you on the carpet. You're afraid the cadets won't salute you. You're afraid they're laughing at you behind your back. No, no, I'm not. No, no, you keep quiet. I've got a gun. You're afraid of using the wrong fork at dinner. You're afraid people are looking at you, laughing at you. I am not, you... You... You dirty, stuck-up snob! Just because you went to a high hat school, you think you're better than anybody, you you and your crummy little gold braid cadet. Man, you're a pathetic little shrimp. Huh? I understand you perfectly. You're a third rate. Oh. All your life you've been afraid that someone would see through you and send you to the foot of the class. Oh, you're... Throw you right out on your ear where you belong. Oh. 
I don't want to look at you anymore. I, I'll show you. I'll put a bullet in put you. Put down that pop gun before you hurt yourself. Don't you come near me. Don't you come near me or I'll shoot. I'll shoot. You I'll... need that. No. Let me, let me, let me go. Get that pistol. Yeah. And thanks for not disappointing me, man. Uh, 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 I don't understand. I thought if I wounded your little ego, you'd forget to push that button and pull a trigger instead. I'm afraid you'll never make a good executive, Van. They have to know when to push buttons. Davidson. Jane's here. Chief, are you all right? Are you... I'm all right. Attack now and mop up. I'll hold the control room. I've got Van Cleek, and I think his little revolution is just about over. Come, watch them run. Oh, our job is never done, for our roadways go rolling along. While you ride, while you glide, we are watching down inside, so your roadways keep rolling along. Mr. Gaines, oh, Mr. Gaines. Hi, hi. Oh, Mr. Evans, I forgot about you. Yes, I've been waiting at the sector office. Is everything under control? All rolling. Those are the watch engineers going on to the Czech Sacramento sector, inch by inch. Remarkable organization. Remarkable. Hourly's in, Chief. San Diego Circle rolling. Bakersfield, Fresno, Stockton. Stockton? Stockton? Oh, no. What's the matter, Chief? Trouble, Mr. Gaines? It sure is. I promised to meet my wife at Stockton for a show. She's been waiting there since 9 o'clock last night. Dave, see if you can get her for me. Try the sector office. All right, Chief. And, Dave, see if you can calm her down. Oh, sure, Chief. Well, tell her the roads must roll. No, no, don't tell her that. I don't think she'd appreciate it. She's heard it too often. I better get going. Bye, Dave. Keep them rolling. Anywhere you go, you are bound to know that your roadways go rolling along. Keep them rolling. That your roadways go rolling along. Keep them rolling. That your roadways go rolling along. Keep them rolling. That your roadways go rolling along. Keep them rolling. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, Publishers of astounding science fiction. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production. The Mysterious Traveler. Another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. Where are we going? You'll find out when we get there. I hope it's not making you nervous being alone with me here in the dark. Darkness stirs strange terrors in some minds. For the things that happen at night are sometimes most upsetting. Things such as cats that vanish or die, as in the tale of The House of Death. Living out in the country this way, Louise. We're so isolated from everyone. Yes, Martha. It was much nicer when we lived in our own house in the village. Well, even if Roger and Hester are our nephew and niece, we should never have let them persuade us to move out here with them. Mm. Oh, doesn't that wind ever stop blowing? Oh, Martha, Roger and Hester are coming. I, I, I just saw the car turn into the drive. Well, I hope they've brought a maid. Well, what's the matter with Toby and Queenie? Oh, mother's little darling's hungry. Hmm. Even Toby and Queenie don't like living here. Yes, they, they do seem unhappy. But Toby hasn't been eating well at all. Oh, Louise is very foolish out living here with Roger and Hester. I think we should move back to our house in the village where we can really be happy. Oh, Martha, could we? I see no reason why we can't. 
That's so much nonsense about our being invalids and too old to live alone. Hello, Aunt Martha. Aunt Louise. Oh, Roger, were you able to get a maid for it? Oh, I'm sorry about that, Aunt Louise. I tried, but it's just impossible to get a maid these days. But, Roger, you know we need someone to push Louise around in her wheelchair. It's too much for me. Well, I'm sure Hester will do anything you ask. How are you, Aunt Louise? Aunt Martha? I brought you some good hot tea and some biscuits. Thank you, dear. Uh, Roger, Louise and I have been talking things over. Now, it is very kind of Hester and you to invite us to live with you, but we were much happier living in the village and would like to go back to our house. What? But, Aunt Martha, it's much better for you here. Why, of course. You're homesick, that's all. Why, certainly in time you'll come to love this place as we do. Now, we don't want to hear another word about your leaving. We couldn't be happy thinking of the two of you living alone in that house in the village. Come along, Roger. Let them drink their tea. Yes, Hester. Well, see you both later. They're really so good to us, Martha. But I, I do wish they'd let us return to our own house. Mm. The tea tastes strange. Hmm? You got it, Jeff Louise? No. Well, yes, you're right. It, it, it does taste funny. Probably the water they use. Nothing out here seems as good as it was home. You better not drink any more of it. No, oh, do you remember the little teas we used to give when we lived in the village? Mary Thompson came over every afternoon. It was so nice. Mm. There's no reason why we can't move back to our house and have those teas again. But you heard what Roger and Hester said. Our health isn't so good and we need someone to look after us. Well, what of it? All that money Father left us, we can afford a dozen servants. Yes, Louise, I think we'd better plan to return home. The nail car in sight, Louise? No, Martha, not yet. You know, I've been thinking quite a bit these past 24 hours about returning home, and I think we'll leave here in a few days. Oh, Martha, that would be wonderful. Oh, look, here comes George Gibson now with the mail. Oh, and that time, too. Yes, uh, uh, how would that Toby and beautiful Queenie like to go back to their own little home? Oh, Martha, they understand perfectly what you're saying. Look how happy they are. <laughs> Good they do. Hello, Aunt Martha. Oh. Aunt Louise. George Gibson just delivered the Sentinel. Oh, Here thank, you are. Thank you, Roger. We've been waiting all day for you. Oh, that's all right, Aunt Louise. Hester will soon bring you your supper. Uh, now, let's see. Yes. Oh, Martha... Let's look at the obituary notices first. That's just what I was turning to, Louise. <sighs> ah, here we are. Did anybody we know die? Mm, now, let me see. Oh, yes, yes. yes. You remember Amos Wilson, don't you? Yes. He died two days ago. Poor Amos. He was about your age, wasn't he, Martha? Certainly not. He was a good deal older. <gasps> Martha, look at this. Hmm? Why, it says that Mary Thompson is entering the home for the infirm. The poor house? Oh, no, it can't be. Oh, the dreadful place. I'd sooner be dead than in that home. Poor Mary. Oh, I shudder every time I think of that horrible place. The poor house. Martha, after we move back to the village, can't we have Mary come to live with us? Yes, of course. Going to the poor house would be the death of her. Oh. Huh? Louise, what are you staring at in this paper? No. No, it can't be. What can't be? Read what it says in the real estate column. Hmm? The old Abbott mansion, owned by the Mrs. Martha and Louise Abbott, has been put up for sale by their nephew, Roger Abbott. What? Well, it must be a mistake. We never told Roger to sell our house. I wouldn't dream of it. Well, Martha, it's been in the family for almost a century. How oh, could Roger do such a thing? I'll soon find out. Roger. Roger. Now, Martha, you, you mustn't get excited. But why should he want to sell our house? Are you calling me up, Martha? Yes, Roger. What's this in the Sentinel about our house being for sale? Oh, is it in the Sentinel? Oh, I'm sorry. It is a mistake, isn't it, Roger? No, Aunt Louise. Oh, you see, as co-trustee of Grandfather's estate, I thought it would be a good idea to sell the house. 
Prices are high these days, and the house is rather old. But you had no right to put the house up for sale without telling me. I won't hear of the house being sold. Now, you mustn't get excited, Aunt Martha. If you don't want the house sold, I'll remove it from the market. Oh, please do. We couldn't live in the house if it was sold, could all we, All right, Louise? all right. I'll take care of everything. Everything's going to be all right now. Oh, I don't like it, Louise. I don't like it at all. Why did he try to sell it without telling us? It, it does seem strange. Louise... We must get in touch with Judge Smith. Yes. He's the administrator of Father's estate. And he'll take care of everything for us in the way we want it. It isn't that I don't trust Roger, but you must recall the scrape he was in when he attended college. He's that. And then there was the matter of that bad check Roger gave. It hadn't been for his dear Shh. father, he was... Someone's coming, Martha. I have your supper for you. Now, please eat them before they get cold. Yes, yes, sir. There you are. Just call me if there's anything else you want. Yes, does Mother's beautiful Queenie want something to eat? I don't see Toby any place around. Well, he's probably in the kitchen. Now, say pretty please, Queenie and Mother give you this nice piece of meat. <laughs> That's Mother's darling. Here you are. Oh, isn't she lovely, Louise? Oh, yes. Queenie has such wonderful manners. Uh, we'd better eat our soup before it gets cold, Martha. Yes. And as I was saying, Louise, I don't care for Roger's attitude at all. Ask me, he's been behaving very strangely. Yes, Martha. Martha. Hmm? Martha, that, that piece of meat you gave Queenie doesn't seem to have agreed with her. She looks ill. Oh, yes, you're right. Oh, Queenie, what's the matter with Mother's little oh, darling? Oh, Martha, she's in agony. Yes. What can we do? Oh, Roger, Roger, come quickly. Oh, poor Queenie. Roger, she's suffering so hard. Oh, Roger, do something. We must help poor Queenie. Oh, Roger, look. I'm afraid it's too late, Aunt Martha. She's dead. Dead? But she can't be. Oh. She was all right just a few minutes ago. Things like this will happen, Aunt Martha. She was old. She probably had cramps. Roger, you better take Queenie out of here. All right, dear. Poor Queenie. We've had her ever since she was a little kitten. Twelve years now. There, there, Aunt Louise. You mustn't cry. You still have Toby. Now, why don't you eat your supper? You'll feel much better if you do. Yes, sir. How can you speak of food at a time like this? With poor Queenie's body not even cold. I'm sorry, Aunt Martha. If you want me, just call. Oh, Martha, it won't be the same without Queenie. I simply can't understand it. One minute Queenie was perfectly well. Then after you gave her the meat, she became ill. Yes, she was perfectly well until she ate the meat. Mm. Louise, the meat, that's it. Don't understand, Martha. The meat, it was poisoned. Poisoned? Louise, that poisoned meat was meant for us. Martha, you don't mean that Roger and Hester... Oh, no. Yes, no. Louise, they're after our money. Oh, what are we going to do? We, we, we can't get at the phone. We have to get in touch with Judge Smith. Oh. Our lives depend upon it. Two old ladies stared at each other, terror in their eyes. The minutes dragged into hours, and each hour was a nightmare as they waited for the time to come when they could make the one contact between themselves and the outside world. Do you see George Gibson's car yet, Martha? No, Louise, but he should be in sight any minute now. Oh, what if Hester or Roger come home before he gets here? Then we won't be able to talk to him about our message to Judge Smith. Now, Louise, you know Roger isn't due home from work for another hour. Yes, yes, but what about Hester? She's over at the Miller's farm and she's liable to return any minute. Louise, I see George Gibson's car. Oh. He's just turning oh, into hurry, drive. hurry, Martha, hurry. All right, all right. Hurry, hurry. hurry. The window. Oh, Martha, Martha, call to him quick before he gets away. Uh, George? George Gibson? Hello? George, it's Martha Abbott. I want to see you. Oh, it's you, Martha. Well, howdy, I'm coming. He's coming, Louise, you here? Now we'll be able to get in touch with Judge Smith. But after George Gibson left the Abbott sisters, 
He met Hester a half mile up the road. The two conversed for a minute. Then George Gibson continued on his way. Hester stared after him as he drove away, her face tense and white. Then, as if suddenly understanding the implication of his words, she turned and ran towards her home, her heart pounding with fear. Roger! Roger, I just met George Gibson. And he told me that when he delivered the mail here, Aunt Martha and Aunt Louise called him into the house. Called him into the house? Yes. They asked him to get Judge Smith for them at once. I told you it wasn't safe to leave them alone, even with the phone locked in our room. All our plans may have been for nothing. Oh, Roger. Do you think they suspect? I don't know. But I do know it was a mistake letting them talk to George Gibson. After all our careful work, we can't let everything be spoiled now. <laughs> These past 24 hours have been endless. Where can George be? He's probably delayed somewhere. Oh, Martha, Martha, there. George is coming. He just turned into the drive. I told you he wouldn't fail us. Oh, but Roger and Hester are in the house now. What if they don't let George see us? Nonsense. When George has a message to deliver, he delivers it. I've just, just gone out to get the mail, but... Louise. What is it, Martha? What's wrong? That isn't George Gibson driving the mail car. What? The man driving it's only a youngster... Now he's leaving. Martha, what does it mean? I don't know. I don't understand. Perhaps George is ill and he couldn't come today. Hello, Aunt Martha Louise. This magazine just came in the mail. Thought you might like to see it. Thank you, Roger. Why didn't George Gibson deliver the mail? Oh, so you noticed there was a new driver today? Yes. I'm sorry to tell you this, but poor George Gibson was killed last night. Killed? Oh, no. He had an accident as he was returning to the village. An accident? Yes. I don't want to speak any more about it. It'll just upset you. Hester will bring you your supper soon. Oh, poor George. That means Judge Smith never got our message. Oh, Martha. Do we don't you see it wasn't an accident? But Roger said it was. George it? was deliberately killed to keep him from going to Judge Smith. <gasps> Martha, you don't mean that Roger and Hester... Yes, Louise. He won't stop at anything to get our money. Oh, Martha, I'm so frightened. Oh, we must have courage or we're lost. Oh, but if we can't get word to the outside and, and they're poisoning our food. Well, we haven't eaten a thing since poor Queenie died. We can't go on throwing food away or we'll starve. There's only one thing to do, Louise, if we're not to starve. Toby, must sample our food before we eat it. You mean to see if it's poisoned? Yes. Oh. Oh, I know it's dreadful risking poor Toby's life like that. But it's the only thing to do. And meanwhile, we must get in touch with Judge Smith. We must. You are, Toby, a nice piece of meat for mother, little darling. Aunt Martha? Why are you feeding Toby? He gets plenty to eat in the kitchen. Of course. I've always fed Toby for my own plate. He expects it. But Aunt Martha, if you feed that meat to the cat, there won't be enough for you. Yes. If you're to get well, you need all that food. Now, I don't want you feeding Toby any more of it. Here, Toby. Come along, boy. Come on out to the kitchen while Aunt Martha and Louise eat their supper. What, Martha? Louise, I've brought you your lunch. Doesn't it look good? Yes, Hester, it's very nice. Lunch, eh? Here, Toby. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Hester, have you seen Toby? No, Aunt Martha, I haven't. Oh, but where could he be? Toby's always on time for meals. Well, he's probably someplace around the house. Oh. Now eat your lunch before it gets cold. Oh, Martha, where can he be? Toby will be along in a few minutes. We won't touch a bit of this food until he's tried it first. Oh, I do wish he were here. I'm so hungry. Please, don't touch a thing on that tray. It isn't safe. Oh, here, Toby. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, kitty, 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 kitty. Good evening, 
Aunt Martha. Louise, how are you? Good evening, Roger. I have your supper here for you, too. Aunt Martha, neither of you ate your lunch. What's wrong? We... we weren't hungry, Hester. Have you found Toby yet? No. I've looked everywhere for him, but he seems to have disappeared. Oh, no. Now, you mustn't worry. I'm sure he'll turn up. Yes. Aunt Martha, you and Louise can't afford to miss meals in your state of health. Why, certainly not. Now, we want you to eat everything that Hester has brought you. Yes, you'll make us very unhappy if you don't. Now, eat it while it's hot. Come along, Roger. I'll get you your supper. All right, dear. Did you hear what she said about Toby Louise? Yes, he's vanished. Nonsense. They've killed him. You saw how angry they were last night when we fed Toby from our plates. They've killed him so he won't spoil their plans. Oh, Martha, what are we going to do? I'm so hungry. Got to get word to Judge Smith before it's too late. But how? Tomorrow, I'm going to go out to the road and try to get to the village. But, Martha, it's, it's two miles to the village, and you know you can't walk more than a few yards. You, you're not strong enough. Louise, with either starvation or poisoning staring us in the face, we haven't any choice. I must try to reach the village. The next morning, after Roger had left for the village and Hester had gone to the Miller farm, Martha dressed as quickly as her shaking hands would permit. Louise watched nervously as her sister quietly opened the door and started on her long, painful way to the village. Hello, Aunt Louise. Oh, why, where's Aunt Martha? Uh, Aunt Martha? Uh, she's someplace around the house, but I've just been through the house. Why, her closet is open, and her hat and coat are missing. Aunt Louise, did Martha leave this house? Why, uh, oh, why, yes, she, uh, she said she wanted to go for a walk. Go for a walk? At her age and in weather like this? Well, it'll be the death of her. Did she start out toward the village? Answer me. Yes, yes, to Telephone Roger at his office. She must be stopped. Twenty minutes later, as Roger drove along the road leading to his home, he saw a small figure in the distance. It was Aunt Martha. There was a weary, painful look on her face as she hobbled towards the village. In spite of her determined resistance, he put her in his car and drove rapidly on home. One thought was uppermost in his mind. He must make sure that this could never be repeated. Oh, Martha, I'm so hungry. Yes, Louise, I know. So am I. We've gone three days now without eating. We left them our money and our wills. Why must they kill us? They're nothing but common murderers. Oh, if there was only some way to get word to the village. Louise, I've got an idea. What is it, Martha? If we were to set fire to the house, they'd see it in the village. Yes. And then, then the fire company would come out. Then we'd be able to tell them we'd be saved. Oh, oh but Martha... Hester and Roger would put out the fire before it could get big enough. Louise, I know a way we can prevent them from putting out the fire. You do? Yes, and we can save ourselves, Louise. We can save ourselves. Here, Toby. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Aunt Martha. Why are you looking down the cellar? You should be in your room. Yes, it's drafty out here in the hall. Now, come on, close the cellar door and go back to your room. But I heard Toby crying. He's down in the cellar, and I won't go to my room until I get but him. But Aunt Martha, Roger, he... just to put Aunt Martha's mind at ease, why don't you go down to the cellar and see if Toby is there? Oh, all right. If you ask me, it's just a waste of time. Oh, please help him look for Toby, Hester. You'll find him so much quicker if you both look for him. Oh, very well. But you go back to your room so you won't catch cold. Roger, do you see him? He doesn't seem to be any place here in the cellar. Oh, now we'll see just how smart you are trying to poison us. There, he won't stop us from escaping now. Oh, I must get Louise. Louise! Louise! Yes, oh, Louise, it worked. Martha, you mean you, you were able to lock them in the cellar? Yes, and with the door locked, they can't get out. Oh. And Martha, unlock this door. Let us go. 
Oh, they found out they're locked in. Don't you worry about it, Louise. I'll take care of everything. Oh, Martha. And Martha. Martha, what are you doing with that kerosene lamp? I'm pouring the kerosene around the room so that it'll burn better. Oh, yeah. You ready to leave, Louise? Yes, Martha. Then I'll strike a match and start the fire. Oh, oh, how quickly it's starting to spread. Yes, we better leave. I'll push your wheelchair, Louise, and you try to help by rolling the wheels. Yes, Louise. There. Yes, we're coming along nicely. Oh, Martha, I hate to do this. Louise, you mustn't waste any pity on them. Even if they are our niece and nephew, they're nothing but common murderers. Yes, I suppose you're right. Now I'll just open the front door and we'll be free. Now, roll the wheels a bit, Louise. Yes, I am. Just a few feet more and we'll be safe. There, there, there. Far enough away from the house to be perfectly safe. Oh, my. The whole house is on fire now. Yes, lovely fire, isn't it? <sighs> I don't feel cold at all. Oh, do you think they can see it in the village by now, Martha? I'm sure they do. Now remember, Louise, when the fire company gets here, we don't know what happened to Roger and Hester. We just managed to get out ourselves. Yes, Martha. If we told them what we were forced to do to escape, we'd have to reveal that our own niece and nephew were poisonous murderers. We don't want to disgrace the family name, Louise. Oh, no, Martha. Of course not. Oh, look, look, Martha, look. The roof is beginning to go. A few minutes later, the fire company arrived to find Martha and Louise in the garden, staring at the roaring fire which had been their home. It was too late to save the other occupants of the house, so the men were forced to stand by helplessly and watch it burn. Good morning, Judge Smith. Good morning, Miss Martha, Miss Louise. I trust you're well after that terrible ordeal last night. We're much better, thank you, Judge. Well, now that your niece and nephew are gone, we must plan for your future. Oh, you don't have to bother, Judge. All we want to do is move back to our old house, hire a few servants, and live as we used to. Oh, and I was wondering if you could arrange to have Mary Thompson come live with us. I won't hear of her going to that dreadful home for the infirm. Oh, no, it would be the death of her. Ladies, I'd hoped I'd never have to reveal the truth to you, but now it appears I must. I don't understand, Judge. Last month, the bonds in the trust fund your father left you became utterly worthless. What? Your nephew and niece were afraid the shock of learning you were penniless would kill you. So it was decided to keep the news from you. That's why the three of us persuaded you to move in with them. Your house here in the village had to be sold to meet debts of the estate. But, but that can't be. Father left us so much. It's all worthless now. Perhaps I should have told you this a month ago. But your niece and nephew wouldn't hear of it. In spite of the fact that they had only Roger's salary to live on, they were determined to prevent you from ever learning of your misfortune. But the... the deaths of poor Queenie and Toby. Of, of, of George Gibson. George Gibson? Yes. I'm afraid I don't understand. Surely you heard he was killed a few days ago when a tire on his car blew out and it overturned. You mean he wasn't murdered? Certainly not. Oh. Are you feeling well? Has my news been too much for you? No, no. Well, now that your niece and nephew are gone and there's no one to support you, I'm afraid there's only one thing left. One thing left? What's that? I'm sorry to say, the home for the infirm, the poor house. This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip? 
too bad about the Abbott sisters. Such nice old ladies. But then, how were they to know that poor Queenie died of cramps, not poison? After all, you can't be too careful, can you? Would you care for a sandwich? They're very delicious. I make them myself. Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. Perhaps you'll join me again soon. I take this same train every week. You've just heard Chapter 9 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The House of Death, Irene Hubbard played Martha Abbott and Elizabeth Morgan played Louise Abbott. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Robert Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled The Man Who Knew Too Much. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday at 7 over most of these stations. This is Mutual. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.